Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Fantasy Fund Manager Secrets to the Professional Investors. Uh, my name is Tahala Kandwala. I'm the Deputy Personal Finance Editor at the Telegraph. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, we have a good session for you. It's about 45 minutes. And we're going to take you through some expert views on how markets are moving at the moment. We're going to look at what that means for share prices going forward in the next month and perhaps for the rest of the year. Hopefully giving you all some fresh ideas for, the, for your fantasy funds and also your real life investments. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Fantasy Fund Manager, uh, this is the Telegraph online um, share picking game. We're winning exclusively for our subscribers. Uh, investors are given £100,000 at the start and they have to turn it into as much as possible by February 19. Um, there's still time to sign up for those of you who aren't playing uh, and you can still win the £10,000 prize as long as you uh, join before Friday. Um, the game's a lot of fun. It kind of forces you to um, think about investing in a slightly different way, in a different way to your real life investments. Well, hopefully anyway, that's because, you know, changes are limited. You can hold between, you can only hold between five and 20 stocks. And it really is all about throwing caution to the wind and kind of making the most out of the quick buy and sells. Um, today, we're going to be looking at strategies for both fantasy investing, but also some perhaps more sensible approach for real life investing as well. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. I know some of you have submitted some questions already, and thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. We're going to try and get through as many as possible, but apologies in advance if we can't cover ex yours exactly. Um, for, you should see on the right-hand side uh, a live chat box. If you could please submit your questions in there, and then we'll try and pick out some of the best ones and discuss them. Um, we're also going to be doing some polls this evening as well, so please do take part, uh, just kind of gauging your views on kind of stocks or sectors and also the game itself. Um, I'd like to welcome the first panelist this evening, who is Maya Bandiri. Maya runs multi-asset strategies at Columbia Threadneedle, the city firm. She joined that firm in 2004 and is responsible for all of the multi-asset funds in that area, um, looking at kind of global markets, stocks and bonds, you name it. Welcome, Maya. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Um, also joining us this evening is Lee Hemsworth. Lee manages the Fidelity UK Opportunities Fund. He's got 20 years experience um, specifically in British stocks, so he's a bit of an expert on the market and is also a regular Telegraph money contributor via our Diary of Fund Manager column. Welcome, Lee. How are you doing? Good evening. It's nice to be with you. Likewise, likewise. Um, this evening, we are going to discuss markets. We are going to discuss stocks, uh, both good and bad. And Lee and Maya, who are both experts in their field, are going to give their opinions. However, I, I do have to stress um, they are their, these are their opinions. Um, please take away a lot from this and let that feed into what you think uh, and how you decide on your own investments. But we must stress that only you can be responsible for the investments that you make. And you should always make them based on your own circumstances. Uh, Lee and Maya, as good as they are, cannot um, account for that for everyone this evening. Um, so just with that in mind, let's crack on. Um, so I want to start this evening talking about themes. Um, I know that sounds a little vague, um, but the reason why I think it's an interesting topic is in the Fantasy Fund Manager game in the first season, which ran over the summer, there was a big theme that kind of drove um, what, how people were doing. And the, you know, the, the kind of fifth of you here this evening will understand what I mean is it was gold miners. Uh, the gold price was spiking over July, uh, kind of into August. And basically, if you didn't own gold miners in the first game, you had you kind of shot yourself in the foot and didn't have a chance of winning. Um, so. But what's happened kind of this year is, I suppose, but seeing this in January, and I'm sure Maya and Lee will agree, is that it's kind of hard to really discern what's driving share prices at the moment. Um, so wait, just to me that question, Maya, um, given your view and your kind of macro view on, on markets, um, what, is, what, is, what is driving prices at the moment? Uh, thanks, Taha, and good evening again, everyone. Uh, there are lots of variables uh, driving share prices uh, at the moment, and I think one of the real uh, challenges uh, for all of us as investors is really picking out uh, what matters and what doesn't, uh, and over what period. And now, I would point to perhaps three key developments right now that I think really matter for both the very near term, uh, but also that 12 to 18 months out view that, that Lee and I uh, normally look to. Uh, the first is, uh, is, is the news on the vaccine and its successful deployment, uh, which of course was one of the key factors that really led to that first leg uh, of the cyclical uh, rally that we saw uh, late last year. Yeah. Uh, now we at Columbia Threadneedle, like most others, were expecting some sort of vaccine to be announced, but the sheer number of successful vaccines and with much greater efficacy was an upside surprise uh, to both us uh, and to markets. And I think the timing here has been crucial uh, because it's allowed investors to really look through fairly powerful and frankly disruptive second wave of the virus through uh, many parts of the world, including, of course, uh, uh, the UK. So I think that's certainly one key factor. 
the second, and I think very much related to that turn in, in markets, is actually development a bit further afield in, in the US. Uh, with the incoming uh, President Biden securing more fiscal support uh, for the U.S. economy, which we learned of uh, yesterday. And now, of course, the results from Georgia secured a thin majority for the Democrats in the Senate, uh, in addition to the lower chamber that they already control. Uh, and bond markets and, and break-evens in particular have moved, uh, if you like, to price in a better medium-term economic outlook on, on government spending more. Uh, U.S. tech yields have moved higher and through the recent range. Now, you might ask, why does this matter so much? Uh, well, uh, as, as I'm sure we will come, come to uh, in, in due course, equity markets really outside the UK, where there might be reasons for cheapness, but equity markets outside the UK are really very, very expensive. Uh, and relatively contained bond yields or well-behaved bond yields, are, I think we think are quite central uh, in delivering uh, equity valuations. We expect yields to be relatively capped. Uh, but, uh, but and, you know, central banks are, of course, also uh, ultra easy. Uh, but I think it's, it's worth keeping an eye on, on what bond markets do. And finally, uh, closer to home, uh, Brexit. Uh, now, we've yes. clearly avoided a no deal Brexit. Uh, but, but in our view, uh, the deal is pretty skinny. Uh, and the disruption from non-tariff barriers remains quite significant, as, as we see on the news every, every morning. Uh, and at CTI, again, we're cautious on, on UK growth, more cautious than many of the investment banks, certainly. Uh, although I should say on, on extreme valuation uh, and after really deep underperformance just last week, we've neutralized uh, our underweight. Uh, and I guess one factor supporting this is increased M&A interest, uh, signature aviation uh, being, being the latest, perhaps a more, and perhaps a more constructive uh, outlook on, on things like, uh, like commodities uh, as well. But Brexit is key. Uh, okay. uh, 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 I just want to pick up on the vaccine point you made. So obviously we've got different countries wanting at different speeds on the vaccine. Um, yeah. So in that regard, how does that how does that kind of play? So obviously, you know, we obviously got quite a good rollout going on at the moment, actually looking fairly successful um, in terms of escalating the output. So is that something that we can be positive about and expect maybe even more of a bump in British share prices soon? Well, I think the vaccine news is certainly a positive for the UK. I mean, we have we certainly have uh, have more vaccines, but I think uh, than other parts of the world. But I, I do think that you know you've got the vaccine on the one hand, the positive news of the vaccine, and then you've got the uh, the negative uh, of, of of extended lockdowns and uh, and uh, and virus fears on, on the other. And it's really about how those two things uh, balance out. So That's you could say enough. in parts of Asia, for example, the rollout of the vaccine is is further behind uh, than it is than it is here. Uh, but their experience with the virus itself has been a lot less disruptive. No, it's really balancing yeah. out this today. No, of course, very good point. Very good point. Um, how, Lee, how about from your side? Um, obviously, you're you're looking more British focused. You're you're doing your, you know you're a stock picker. Um, how much attention do you pay to kind of external factors like this when you're when you're picking your stocks? Yeah, there's a load of what's been said that is absolutely crucial to keep an eye on. It's it's okay picking stocks, but if you're picking them against the tide, then it is pointless to own certain companies. So absolutely, you need to have an eye on, one, the cost of finance, i.e. bond deals, very much so. And that's really the driver over uh, upwards of six months out in terms of where we invest. And then we need to keep an eye on what's happening on a fiscal basis as well, the tax stimulus that's there, the scale of which we saw last year was, was immense and probably unprecedented as well. And something that's likely to continue, yes, we may well be at peak COVID in terms of news flow and the negative news flow, but it's likely to see, we're likely to see the tax remain open for the foreseeable future because we've had such a big hit to the economies. There's so much capacity to mop up before we get any sense of any overheating or anything, uh, economies getting carried away. And I think it's, it's right for us to be sensible in our approach, be balanced, whereas it was very much the case of let's just go all for growth and all for safety last year, and that did very well, other than maybe the gold mining stocks. Um, yeah. And this year, I think it's going to be right to be balanced because it's not necessarily clear which method is going to take over, whether it's value, whether it's growth again, whether it's defensive. And I think there's a lot of question marks. I think the key difference from last year to this is that we've gone from significant political uncertainty with Brexit, with the US presidential elections, and with the upheaval of COVID into a, a period where perhaps that's behind us, but we're likely to see lots of economic instability and question marks over the economics. Now, that's a great stock picking market there, hopefully. Hopefully. No, I can uh, agree with you on the value strategy. Obviously, I 
in my fantasy fund, I went um, I went all in value. Uh, I'm sure plenty of other players did as well. And uh, I am um, kind of slightly ashamed to tell you that has not worked out in the slightest. Um, so the other thing I suppose that's going to drag up British shares, the, the one reason why the market has been held back and was held back last year is obviously the oil price and our kind of the, the UK stock market's exposure to oil. Um, yeah. So how much how much weight should investors give to the kind of oil price and commodity prices right now? Because, um, you know, the oil price is still down 16% over one year, but is, you know, trading, you know, $40 higher than it was since it's low and about 50% higher. So how much yeah. how much should that factor into kind of stock, stock decisions? I think the oil price in the UK is significant because we've got such a big sector in the UK. Uh, you know, you can think of, of a handful of companies off the top of your head before you get into some of the smaller companies. So BP and Shell clearly are, are huge chunks of the UK index. And also they pay a massive chunk of the dividend as well. Now, the importance of that was through last year as the oil price collapsed to below $20 a barrel, even the dividends of those companies were being called into question temporarily. If the oil price is going to remain low, there were question marks over whether that was going to be paid. So it was right to avoid the sector. Yeah. Whereas now, as the, the oil price has rebounded for a host of reasons, but really because OPEC's got its act together, uh, we see a lot more economic activity primarily from the Far East at the moment, the oil price has, has recovered to well over $50 a barrel. So where we were worried about um, whether some of those companies would survive last year, actually now they're all thriving and should be generating very high levels of free cash. So it is a very attractive sector to look at at the moment, albeit longer term, we have question marks over green energy, et cetera. Yeah. Oil at the moment and perhaps for the next month is somewhere to really pay attention to. No, absolutely. Uh, Maya, how much is kind of oil and commodities playing on your radar at the moment? Uh, well, commodity markets are certainly interesting. I mean, after falling by around 7% or so uh, last year, our commodities team are looking for a rally of around 20% uh, this year. So, so quite a bullish tilt on, on commodities. Uh, why the bullishness? Uh, well, I think it's, it's, it's partly a lot of scope to catch up, given how much commodities lagged other markets, particularly if that better economic outcome uh, materialises, uh, but also fundamentals on, on both the, de the demand and the supply side. Uh, so, I mean, on, on the demand side, the, the transition to democratic leadership in the U.S., supportive fiscal policy, and the rollout of vaccines that we just touched on are all, are all chief uh, supports. Cool. Uh, and quite perversely, at least in the very short term, uh, going green is actually quite supportive uh, for industrial commodities that are actually required to build uh, the necessary uh, infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the supply course. side, meanwhile, has been quite significantly curtailed by COVID-19, uh, where, you know, maintaining social distancing in a mine, uh, for example, <laughs> simply led, uh, led to sharp, sharp, sharp cutbacks. Um, yeah, now, I guess, you know, I mean, uh, commodity, uh, commodity prices rising could help commodity-focused firms and indices. So the UK, of course, has a higher weight of commodities than most others uh, and, and could benefit. But I guess the question then is, uh, and maybe this is, is, is much more in, in, in Lee's uh, uh, area, but uh, many commodity companies don't have terrific balance sheets. Uh, and so I guess it's, it's a question of, you know, picking the commodity that you like and then looking for the balance sheet that you think is uh, is most sustainably geared geared uh, towards that. Uh, I should also say that commodities have the advantage of not being correlated with broader, broader risk moves. Uh, so they're quite nice to own in conjunction with other things. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, OK, great. Thank you for that. Um, so I just want to kind of move on to something you said earlier as well. You you mentioned M&A was a huge thing, so mergers and acquisitions, and this is takeovers. Um, we've seen kind of three big takeovers, or Entain was one of them that saw a spike, but obviously news today that that seems to have fallen apart. Um, but still interesting that international companies like MGM looking at Entain, obviously a huge British gambling firm that, with uh, kind of Mad Brooks and Coral, um, that rose 25% just on news of that. Um, Callison Energy, another FTSE 250 stock, that went up 25% on takeover news. Um, Lee, is this something on your radar? Is this something that and players that should be looking out for as well? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I think... Um... I think what we've seen for the last few years since the, the, the vote to leave the European Union is that the UK markets traded discount to its obvious peer groups, you know, Germany, France, US, etc. And I think that that's remained the case until probably today still. And then you have other factors on top of that that make the UK market attractive. One, the currency is still trading at a discount to where we were at the Brexit vote. And the UK market still offers some value with some great companies as well. The UK market has got great accounting, great corporate governance. It's very liquid, so it's easy to buy companies as targets. 
And so that's something that I think will, will continue. The, the evidence so far is that the targets are what I would regard as the finished article where the people bidding for those companies are looking for a, a footprint, they're looking for an easy, uh, bring them into their own businesses without having to do an awful lot to fix them. So the targets so far have been the likes of William Hill, which is, a, again, a household name up and down the country, RSA as well, which people all, all know very well, Entain, probably less well known, but Labrooks is very well known, Corals is as well. Uh, they, were, they were called GVC until very recently, but also I've seen Go Compare. Uh, get taken out as well very recently. So I think that will continue. And I think if you want to play that theme, you should stick with the, the companies that you think actually that's a good company and that would fit nicely with an American or a German or a French uh, buyer. Yep, that makes sense. Uh, Maya, in terms of the kind of more macro pictures, is the kind of global money circling around Britain, you know, British stocks to say, is that something that you're kind of picking up? Well, actually, about just before this, I joined a Goldman Sachs call uh, where there was a really striking chart just showing how underweight folk are uh, UK assets and how poor the float picture has been uh, really since 2016, when, of course, uh, our, our, our long Brexit process began. Yeah. Uh, we're certainly seeing more m and interest in the UK now that the prospect of, uh, of chaos is, is behind us. Uh, and, and, and that, along with, uh, uh, with commodities, which we just discussed, I think are sources of support. Uh, for the UK and, and at Columbia Threadneedle led us to raise uh, our exposures uh, to neutral uh, on, on, on the UK. Uh, I mean, to the point that Lee just made, I mean, the UK market is very cheap. I mean, it's 35% discount versus the US, for example, uh, in aggregate terms. And it's also, as, as Lee pointed out, very correlated with that value versus uh, growth trade. I was looking at some data earlier, and I think the correlation right now is about 90%. It's, amongst, it's about the highest it's ever been uh, so certainly something worth keeping an eye on okay great that's an interesting point you made there um as well and also lee one that you made about um it being finished articles because you know a lot of people will think of kind of takeover targets and cheap stocks and then look at you know perhaps the airlines and carnival and stuff like that and go you know they're so discounted that they will be taken over but it seems to be that you you think it'd be more established firms that are kind of not not in that value play yeah i think so I, i'm sure that will happen if if the the economic recovery continues but you need a degree of confidence that that will continue to take over companies like that where there is still a question mark over i think the the comment was made earlier about the the sustainability of the balance sheet how well financed those companies are you know if, if covid restrictions continue for a long run some of these companies that we're talking about carnival the airlines etc are not just dependent on the uk that depends on other countries and so <clears throat> so we do need to make sure that the finance well enough to to cope with the reopening and so it's the finished article that's the that's the early winner okay great um okay that's uh that's really good so we've had a couple of questions in already um i think one was possibly already our youngest uh listener um and this is on <clears throat> recovery stocks, which is something that I did want to spend a lot of time discussing this evening. I'm sure mm. you guys don't want to hear it. So um, by recovery, we also mean value, you know, this is buying shares that are depressed way beyond the, the kind of book value or the worth of a company. Um, it actually re it requires investors to be very confident on the economic outlook, uh, also willing to take a punt. Um, that's some good value plays in the, in the British market at the moment. We saw them spike with the first vaccine, second and third. Um, but actually, Maya, each time a vaccine was announced, you mentioned the vaccine play and obviously markets being surprised, you guys being surprised by, by how good these vaccines were. But what we did see is that after each time the vaccine was announced, there was a much, much smaller play. So um, is there still value trades to be made this year? Um, is it worth chasing? And, you know, also what's happening in other markets? We're talking about British value predominantly, but Britain's obviously kind of value in itself. So what's happening elsewhere? Um, well, I mean, I guess uh, uh, value has has sort of had a had a smartish uh, rally, uh, but of course, uh, still has quite a long way uh, to go after more of a decade or so of underperformance. Uh, versus growth. I mean, the rally that, that we've seen uh, doesn't appear to be more than a blip on some of these uh, longer term uh, charts. Now, while um, you know, value and cyclicals, I think, overlap a lot, uh, they don't always. Uh, and, uh, and value has lagged behind uh, cyclicals uh, this time. So if I could answer this question 
slightly differently. I prefer cyclical exposure uh, here uh, rather than value exposure. Um, yeah, you've had yeah. huge stimulus that benefits cyclical companies. Uh, as Lee just reflected, you know, a lot of companies are going to come out of this in, in worse shape than they went in, particularly, say, uh, travel and leisure uh, sectors. And you know, all the debt that has been given from governments and central banks uh, will need to be paid back. Uh, and so our preference um, uh, is really for some of the Asian names that have had better COVID experiences, stronger growth, and indeed a bunch of earnings. So today, for example, uh, I paid the same at an index level, uh, around 15 times 2021 earnings uh, for exposure to the UK market, uh, as I do for Korea. Uh, but in Korea, earnings are expected to be double what they were at the end of 2019 in 2022, Whereas in the UK, they're expected to be 1% above uh, where they were in, in, in 2019 and yeah. in 2022. So we really prefer those cyclical areas uh, with good earnings going through rather than a pure value. Okay, great. Uh, and Lee, I suppose I, I want to take uh, Rocco from Repton, who's age 12. So wonderful that someone so young is joining us this evening. Um, Rocco is asking, you know, at what point do you think recovery stocks will be optimal? I suppose this is the big question here is that how like buying value stocks is, is well enough, but I suppose particularly in the game, what are the signs people should be looking for to know when's the right time to pay value? Yeah. Wow, I think at the age of 12, I was still watching It's a Knockout, which I think <laughs> is um, is very different. But the, the, I think it's a great question. And I think what I, I the way I try and answer it always with the idea of value is to try and look at companies that you think that the stock market will look at them differently in a few months time or six months time. There's no point buying a stock just simply because it's cheap because it could be cheap for a host of reasons. And I think that the point's just been made that I think what COVID's done or the virus has done is that it's accelerated a lot of trends that were already happening. So more people shopping online, perhaps working from home, etc. And I think if your stock falls into one of those categories where it's been hit more, by what we've seen in the last nine months or so, then probably avoid it. But if we can find stocks that look good value, perhaps because of what's what's happened outside the, 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 the normal course of business, then can we find some stocks that are going to be viewed in a different way? Have they done something in the period, i.e. restructured themselves or restructured a balance sheet or sped up closures of businesses exit to get them fit for purpose coming out of this? And I think that's where we want to look at, at companies. I, I give one example, and this is not a recommendation at all, but the way to think about it is Marks & Spencer, just over a year ago, announced the joint venture with Ocado to, so that they could move into the, the online food retailing offering building on a very strong brand that they have, but also at the same time raising money <laughs> so they could put themselves on the front foot. Rather than having to sell, fire sell properties, they then put themselves in a position where they can, at their own leisure, sell properties for the right reasons because they want to restructure properly rather than just simply sell something to raise cash. And that's what we're looking for, a company that's done something positively to be viewed differently. And it, it will come in time as the earnings start to improve and the outlook starts to improve from those companies. But look for those companies where something's changed. And maybe that's something like restaurant group that's that's closed a lot of stores or outlets that they needed to do and they've re refocused significantly on Wagamama and the pub chains. But look for those sorts of companies rather than simply looking at something it's cheap. Will the company be viewed differently and is it going to be bigger in five years time? And those are the questions I think that will be more rewarding than simply buying lowly valued stuff. Okay. So with, with m and I'm just going to uh, pick up on this slightly. The, just take the last thing you said that it needs to be bigger in five years time. So do you do you genuinely believe m and will be bigger in five years time? Because it has a it has a huge legacy business that, that I mean, well, quite frankly, isn't growing. No, it, uh, absolutely. I think if you wound the clock back pre the venture with Ocado, the balance sheet was showing stress, not to the same degree as something like Debenhams, but it was starting to move that way. Lots of problematic businesses. The food was a, a great business, but not really of any scale, no online uh, offer. The, the clothing was a little bit awry in terms of its ranges, the furnishings, etc. Uh, and so it was reaching a point where a massive estate up and down the country of stores that are in 
that are in places that they probably couldn't sell out of, even though they'd made great play over the years and it been a great uh, piece of value for the company. But all of a sudden with the venture and raising the money and taking the pressure off the balance sheet, they can start to pick and choose where they restructure, what they do with the estate, as opposed to panic selling things. And so it's a very different approach for management. And, and hopefully it pays off in time, only time will tell. But I think it was it was quite a master stroke with the, the online food offering because one Ocado is probably best in class in that space for the, the mechanics behind the scene. And M&S has got a, 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 an extremely strong brand in food through the country. And you can get your Percy pigs delivered now. Okay, great. Um, I just want to talk about travel stocks briefly. Um, so I, again, like one of many, um, thought about using travel stocks in my fantasy fund, and that I, I can assure you has not worked out. Uh, neither has my, you know, my EasyJet purchase, which I bought last year. So I bought EasyJet after it fell thirty three percent, thinking there's no way that this company can fall further. Um, I just don't, I'm still down sixteen percent on that. Um, so now we're kind of looking at the, the tail end of this. What what are your thoughts on the travel sector, particularly you know the, the kind of big companies, EasyJet, um, so it's Ryan and Lesso because it, it's no longer listed here, and Carnival, I international consolidated airlines and uh, yeah. too as well what are your thoughts yeah i think i think it's actually it's a really good question because it's something that i think you know over the next month will be a great play probably but i would categorize the companies as which companies can open quickly or are likely to open quickly i think that the long haul stuff the iag british airways of this world is probably still under significant pressure because it Yes, whilst we might vaccinate a lot of people, the, the destinations might not necessarily do so. Equally, business travel, I think, may be under continued pressure, whereas people may have made five long haul visits a year previously. They might bring that down to three or maybe four. And that's a big hit to earnings for some of those companies that rely on business class sales. Carnival equally, uh, the sorts of destinations, again, that they go into may not necessarily be as up to speed vaccination wise. So I would temper my enthusiasm there, albeit it's cheap and you get the gearing effect of of a, a cruise ship into needing to fill the the, um, the fixed cost, basically. But uh, I think a great way to play it is the likelihood is as soon as people get vaccinated, they're going to want experiences rather than shopping. Shopping's not been a problem. You can online from Assos, Amazon, et cetera. But we we all need a holiday, basically. And so as soon as you get vaccinated, people, are, I think, are going to book to go to Spain or go to see relatives through Europe or wherever they live. And so, yes, EasyJet is probably a great way to play that. Jet2 equally. Ryanair technically is an Irish listed company. So I don't know whether it falls into the remit of this. But those sorts of short haul that, that pounded to short haul destinations, short breaks, et cetera, in addition to some business, I think that's probably a great way to play it. And then leisure on top of that, you can include the likes of Whitbread uh, too for the um, for the hotels as well so in the UK and Germany. So that's the owner of Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, yes. Yeah, cool. Um, okay, great. Uh, Maya, so there's you know a month left to the game. We've had the vaccine rollouts. We're looking at the end of lockdown. Um, how much of this is priced, do you think, priced into certainly the British market and obviously elsewhere as well, or how much are we, do you think we might see something triggered? And if, if so, what would that trigger be? Uh, to be honest, uh, I think that's a question that's next to impossible to answer uh, precisely <laughs> given all the various factors uh, that we discussed at the start. But I think, uh, you know, I think as I, as I think we reflected at the very start, you know, I think the reason why uh, markets have done quite well, single stocks have done quite nicely, uh, despite lockdowns, um, uh, despite second waves of the virus, despite all the uncertainty that that brings, is is, is that good uh, vaccine news? Uh, and so it really is, I think, a function of balancing out. You know, I guess a a lockdown uh, um, that, that ends sooner, uh, without fears of future uh, more harsh lockdowns would be an upside surprise as indeed uh, would be uh, would be the, uh, the deployment of the vaccine uh, more broadly equally i think if if either of those things pulled in in, in the other direction i think that would be a, a, a negative surprise frankly okay great okay i want to uh, kind of move on to some questions so we've had uh, one on green energy um which is an interesting area because obviously we have you know a huge we have the Paris Climate Agreement, a huge shift in this country, um, moving towards green energy, obviously shifts elsewhere, uh, particularly in Europe. Um, Lee, I'll start with you, green energy stocks, um, simply, are they, are they worth it? 
Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think there's a, uh, again, I think it was referred to earlier, there's a, a difference between very short term and long term. Long term, most economies have to move towards a green energy of some form to decarbonize. If we're going to meet any of the um, the, the requirements to, to reduce emissions, we have to move that way. Now, the UK, we're actually quite fortunate in that we have quite a few leaders in the technology. I think if you're wanting to go down the route of batteries, you probably have to go to South Korea and Japan. But we have very good exposure to companies that are generating hydrogen from what's called electrolyzers or using the hydrogen for power through fuel cells. And we have two very, very well-run companies and technological leaders there. There's a company called ITM Power in your, from your hometown in, in Sheffield. And we also have a company called Ceres Power that's heavily involved in fuel cells that's just south of London. Now, both of them are arguably leaders, and you can see that by the joint ventures that they signed up. They signed up with the likes of Bosch, with Linda, with Wei Chai, which is a, a bus operator in China. Do San in Korea. And so those sorts of companies vindicate some of the technology and they're very much leaders. They've had a fantastic run though, both companies. So it's difficult to see them go um, crazy from this point, but ultimately they will be very good long-term um, companies. And, and though it's great to see that they're, they're based in the UK. We also have some flow battery companies, that, but they're much smaller. And that's sort of tomorrow's technology, if you like. So. It's difficult to get too excited about those at the moment, but hydrogen is, is something we all need more of, basically. Oh, fantastic. Good names there. So the names that are definitely popped up uh, in the game as well, and I've definitely you know, seen them floating around when we've done some stock tips on the Telegraph website as well, so that's quite interesting. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick poll on green stocks. I think they're quite interesting. Um, Maya, what about in terms of a more global space? Is, is the green agenda and kind of green stocks and alternative energy, that's something you guys are thinking about? Uh, yeah, very much. I mean, I think green stocks, green bonds, uh, responsible investment uh, more broadly, I think, is, is, is a key area of focus. Uh, and I think on, on the latter, on, on the sort of responsible investment uh, side of things, I mean, I think a lot of people have sort of um, uh, focused on companies that meet all the criteria uh, right here and right now. They're behaving responsibly, they're completely green, uh, so and so forth. I, our emphasis, and I think that's perhaps the right way to think about it, is companies uh, that are are engaging to get there and you want to sort of engage with them and be on that journey uh, with them and perhaps capture uh, some of uh, some of uh, some of um, uh, some of the price appreciation uh, you're likely to get from some of these companies as as they turn green and so we've had a sort of a slightly differentiated approach to this not screening out companies that aren't uh, fully green uh, but also looking to companies that are turning more green to the point that, that I think yeah. Lee made it a moment ago on you know long-term horizons you want to own things that are going in the right direction. Oh, fascinating. That's good. Um, some interesting poll results coming through as well. So we just asked uh, just asked everyone if you were buying tomorrow, would you buy green energy stocks or traditional oil and gas stocks? Um, I'm, I'm quite surprised by this. I suspected a lot more people to say traditional. So, you know, bad news for um, BP and Shell. But I suppose it comes back to what you're saying, my, you know, BP and Shell perhaps, you know, are lumped in traditional, but are spending a lot of money um, turning more green and as maybe, you know, slightly unfairly done and could perhaps, you know, I don't know if Lee, if you have you on this, could actually be ways to, to play green energy to some extent. Yeah, they, they could. I think that the trouble is with it as an investment, if, if you look at Shell as an example, the amount that they're investing in green energy is still a fraction of the overall business. And so if you're wanting to get exposure to green energy as an investor, it's difficult through some of the, the big players. But, you know, it's exactly what Maya said. They have to be encouraged to, to move more green otherwise they're never going to do it and so you know to to support them in that it is 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 good and clearly you get a very good dividend a very good income from those companies as well so as an investment it is it's a good place to be on a, a reasonable time frame cool um okay just another question from uh, robert lockyer who wants to and as it sounds like it might be one for you maya um how to how an investor can kind of discern the difference between how well an economy does versus how well the stock market does. Um, obviously, this is going to be important for especially game plays in the final month. Uh, yeah. The economic figures come out. So, just what, what can they what can they do with that? 
Terrific question. Uh, one line answer, uh, the, the economy is not the market. Uh, and that's uh, really, really the case. I mean, if we look, for example, uh, at, um, at, at, the, at the US, you look at the, it's a consumer spending uh, driven, driven economy, but tech dominates uh, its, its stock market. Uh, you look at the UK, energy and miners dominate our stock market, yet we're quite a services uh, led economy. So they're very different. Mm -hmm. Uh, however, I, I would say that you know clearly economic data do, ma do ma uh, matter uh, for markets more broadly because it tells you how well how well the the, the broader environment is uh, for those companies. So is is growth rising? Is growth falling? And I think at the moment, uh, on the back of the vaccine, you know, on the back of the stimulus and all the things we've been talking about, uh, that that economic growth outlook looks better, and so that's supportive uh, for equity markets. It also, of course, matters uh, for for what we started off our discussion uh, today today with, and that is, um, uh, you know, what what is the policy environment? Because uh, you know, if you if you have a period when and normally, and I don't think this is normal in in, in any way, really, uh, this this recession, but normally, uh, as as you're coming out uh, of a sharp correction, as we have, um, and and things start normalizing, you'd expect central banks and governments to start, you know, reining reining things in a little bit. Um, and there's been a really meaningful shift, I think, in how central banks and governments think about that. It's sort of the, the new paradigm, uh, if you will. Uh, and so I would be less worried today than I might have been in the past if I got a good number that central banks might suddenly decide, right, they're going to step away uh, from the table. I, I don't think that's as much of a concern at uh, this time as it might have been in the past. No, that makes sense. OK, great. Um, so I want to move on to kind of fantasy fund manager as well. Um, I think this is an interesting question, Maya. I want to start with you. So, you know, if you were playing fantasy money manager, unfortunately you can't because I believe your compliance departments will have a huge amount to say about that. <laughs> but <that's, laughs> if, you, if, if you were, uh, what kind of strategy would you be running? Um, well, to me or to leave first? Sorry. No, that was, no. You, that was you first. To, to me first. Okay. So, so I guess I, I, I'm slightly biased. Uh, I, I would probably choose a, a blend of a couple of funds. I choose sort of Trend Needles Asia Fund. Oh, of course. Uh, just to be stocks only. So if you if you were bad, if you had to play on a kind of sector level rather than a fund level, you could do okay, some investment okay. trust. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm happy to do uh, sectors. <laughs> so, so I would probably do. Um, I, I would do a, a mix of, uh, of tech. Yeah. Uh, I'd own some tech. I'd own some healthcare, uh, and I'd own some Asian cyclicals. Nope. So sort of a little bit of a barbell approach, if you like. Yeah, cool. That makes sense. Uh, Lee, what about you? Same question. Yeah, I think all that, that Maya and I have been talking about is probably longer term investments. And I think what I try to explain this is it's like talking about the weather and climate. Climate is what's going to happen on a reasonable time frame that's driven by interest rates, fiscal policy, et cetera, business plans. What happens short term is more the weather. And that's what we're looking for the weather forecast over the next month, basically. And so what is going to drive share prices over the next month? It's probably COVID news. It's probably takeovers, as we've just said, probably the oil price. And as one of your uh, questioners has just said, it's news flow in terms of economics, etc. And so what can we expect over the next month that may cause jumps in share prices or even collapses as well is better news flow in terms of vaccine rollouts, not just from the UK, but from other places, Europe, US, etc. And then can we expect any takeovers? Now, that's a little bit more difficult to predict. And so I wouldn't necessarily choose to play that, but I think you can play the COVID and the reopening story. And maybe, as you suggested earlier, some of the short haul airlines may be the place to go. Some of the pub groups or restaurant groups could be uh, interesting as we, we move to look to reopen. Uh, and so that's probably where you want to be. If you want short term news flow, you know, you could even if you think that we're, we're in for a, a modest market setback because of what Maya said earlier, that things look a little bit elevated near term, you could play maybe a defensive role and have something like a, an insurance company, like a direct line in there, just to hold things up while you've got your spice in easy jet on the runway or something ready for takeoff there. But I think you either go all or nothing in terms of reopening or you have a balance. I think given it's a month, you go all or nothing. Oh, so but that's, you, um, you picked some that's the gambler in me, not the not necessarily the investor <laughs> going for it and, and going crazy. Okay, so you picked out some names there, you just you've mentioned them. So if you were creating a portfolio to us, this is a big question, which five stocks would you have? 
uh, if I was to, if I was to pick out five, and this isn't advice in any way, shape, or form, I'd go Easy Jet, Jet Two, Restaurant Group, Mitchells and Butler, and Direct Line. So I don't go totally crazy. Yep, fair enough. Um, so you mentioned Maya. You mentioned tech. Um, obviously, that's an interesting thing. But obviously, different markets offer different things. You have the you know the huge tech in in the US and some smaller plays uh, domestically. Um, so we have a quick question from Jake Johnson. Hopefully we can answer quite quickly because I'm conscious of time. Um, but AI and robotics, um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that, that as a sector? On robotics, yeah, we, li we like robotics. Uh, one, of the, one of the key reasons why, why Japan is an area that we, we really like from a cyclical perspective. Um, you know, I think there's been a, a, a move to automation that has been accelerated, if you will, a, as a result uh, of, of COVID-19. Uh, and so, yes, uh, we, we like robotics. We like we like some of the sort of hardware tech names, uh, and we like some of the the software tech names. Although I'd say some of the, the some of the software tech names, the US tech names, do look really uh, really fully valued here, um, yeah. and, and well, worth being mindful of that. No, that's fair. Um, Leah, what about yourself? Any have you got any kind of tech favorites closer to? Um, yeah, some of, some of our tech uh, companies have gone really well and done really well for, for uh, the fund, actually, that um, are to run. And some of the computer gaming companies uh, that have benefited from COVID lockdown, people needing to do something on an evening. So the three that spring to mind, the, the bigger ones, Codemasters that was actually bought at the back end of last year, Frontier Development that's uh, heavily involved in strategy games, and then a personal favourite, Team 17, that's also a, a Yorkshire company. I'm, I'm, I'm coming out of lots of Yorkshire ideas here. Uh, no prices for where I'm from. Uh, Team 17 uh, is responsible for worms that uh, a lot of younger viewers may um, may like, and worms rumbles that come out, and they, they are heavily involved in that. So that's been a great place to be. Equally, things like Computer Center that help people log in and maintenance of computers, etc. And that's been heavily in demand over the last year. So we, ha we have a, a string of interesting companies. Uh, again, they're not necessarily the household names that the US beer moths are, but uh, as a consequence, they're, they're a lot cheaper. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, that, unfortunately, that has flown by. And I'm uh, sorry, I didn't get to tackle all the questions uh, that were submitted to us by all. But um, yeah, unfortunately, we are out of time this evening. So I just want to thank you, Maya. Thank you, Lee, both for joining us this evening. Um, it's been a pleasure speaking to you and discussing with us. Um, I'd love to thank a huge thank you to everyone that joined this evening. Um, you know, thank you for your questions and for taking part in the polls and just for coming here. I hope you um, all take some really good ideas um, for either yourselves or for your fund or for both. Um, no, huge amount of you joined us evening. Very humbling uh, on my part. It's been a pleasure doing this. Um, so I'd just like to sign off, say thank you for coming again. Thank you both to Maya and Lee. Um, thank you. Everyone stay safe. And thank you again for joining us. Take care.